Welcome to Cornerstone. I'm really excited to be worshipping our worthy God and Saviour with you this morning. And I hope you are too. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 it says this. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God but didn't think so much of himself that, that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then, and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. And because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. We're here to worship Jesus today. We're here to lift him high and to remind ourselves that uh, he is our God, he is our Savior, that he's worthy of worship and that he's waiting here ready for us to meet with him. Let's worship. Let's go. 
O oh Lord, we gather in your presence on this Sunday following Canada Day. We read of your dominion in Psalm 72 and claim this promise, that your will would prevail in this land. We pray for the movement of your Holy Spirit across this nation and for the work of your church in every province, territory, city, and village. O oh Lord, make us mindful of your generosity and give us a cheerful desire to do your will. Bless our land with honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride, arrogance, and from every evil course of action. Make us who come from many different backgrounds and cultures a united people, one in purpose and vision. Give our government a spirit of your wisdom, truth, and compassion, so that there may be justice and peace in our land. When times are prosperous, lead us to thanksgiving. And when times are troubled, lead us to a deepening trust in you. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Linus Thompson was an Arbuckle. Well, every Sunday afternoon I have people here in the front yard and we have coffee. The first time I had fresh strawberries and ice cream. And the second time I think I had ice cream and bananas. Okay. <laughs> well, it helps your morale when you've got other people talking and laughing and the past of the time, that's for sure. <laughs> they enjoyed themselves, yeah. Just get a, getting, a, getting away from where they're living, eh? It's better than watching television all the time. <laughs> yeah. Called some of the people in their uh, telephone book. If they have one of these, just call anybody in there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone um, who you've invited over that that you wouldn't usually invite over? Like, are there any yeah. new connections? No, they're all ones that I know. No. Yeah. Other than my neighbors and the girl that I worked at the Met Life with, she was going to call me and tell me it was too hot. But when she got here, she was said she was glad she came because we were under the trees and it was cool. Hmm. And she enjoyed the ice cream. <laughs> when she was leaving, she said, let's keep in touch. Mm. And just that, I thought, ooh, I was surprised when she said that. Sometimes it's as simple as finding the phone and ringing someone and asking them over. Um, I think it's... And it's um, amazing the response that you get. Oh, yes, I'd love to. Yeah. What time? Yeah. I come for two. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, invite more people to my place, eh? Hmm. I'm going to keep doing it for July and August. And then September, we'll see what happens then. Lovely. Patience. Something I don't have, but I try to have. Some days it's good, and other days it's not so good. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, you know, thanks for being such an, an inspiration and for helping us as Cornerstone um, keep keeping connected and uh, still doing fellowship and community even uh, during COVID. So, thank you very much. Okay. Cheers. I may even invite my pastor. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be really excited about that. Awesome. Once we're through singing this next song, we will be meeting with each other around the family meal table as we remember 
through communion, the infinite price that Jesus paid for our forgiveness, for our freedom, for our rebirth, and for our new life in him. So I'd like you to uh, make sure that you have your communion elements ready for those in your family or in your household who will be um, sharing in communion after this song.
they were eating Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body then he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new of the, of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins i tell you i will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when i drink it new with you in my father's kingdom friends you who are walking in fellowship with god and are in love and harmony with your neighbors and you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from this time in his holy ways draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to almighty God Oh God of grace and mercy, we thank you that you have ever loved us and provided for our redemption. We thank you for your son who died to save us and for your spirit who invites us to draw near. Lead us now as we remember the suffering of our Lord. Help us to remember the cost of our salvation. Help us to share this meal with you and with each other. And so set apart the bread and the cup in front of us so that as we eat and drink, we may receive the spiritual benefits of Christ's, spoke, Christ's broken body and shed blood. In his name we pray. Amen. Christ's body which he gave for you keep your soul and body unto everlasting life take and eat this remembering that Christ died for you and allow him to nourish your souls by faith with thanksgiving Let's eat. Thank you, Jesus. Christ's blood, which he shed for you. Keep your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. And be thankful. Thank you, Jesus. 
Let's just sing that uh, that verse three of all creatures. Let all things their their creator bless, their savior, their friend, their Lord and Master, who died for their freedom, who died for their redemption, who died yet to purchase them back. Let all things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Praise the Father. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. And praise the Spirit, three in one. And praise the Spirit. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Jesus. Amen. It's not long until their wedding day, and he and she decide to have separate parties, her with her friends and he with his. Her bachelorette party is fun. She's wearing a white t-shirt with uh, pop the champagne, I'm changing my last name, written all over it. And her friends are wearing fun t-shirts too with witty sayings on them. They head out to a restaurant for a couple of hours and they chat and they laugh and then they head back to her apartment where they play some games, where they have a mani pedi, uh, watch some awful chick flicks and generally have a fantastic time. He, on the other hand, uh, has gone all out. He's wearing one of her dresses and his mates are all loving the uh, reflected attention uh, that they are getting. And they start off at one pub, head to another, a third, a fourth. And a couple of hours later, they, they eventually stumble into a nightclub, absolutely wasted. Eventually, they are kicked out of the nightclub, and they end up going somewhere even more sketchy. Anyways, at some point in the small hours of the morning, they catch a taxi back to his mate's place. And he brags about his car and his job and his future wife, and in his drunken haze, he has the inspired idea to call her up and to insist that she comes over so that his mates can window shop the woman that he's about to marry. She listens to his um, drunken request. She slams down the phone and she bursts into tears. What had started out as a perfect night had turned into a nightmare. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Biztha, Harbana, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Karkas, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. 
Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Mimukin, the seven nobles of Persia and Media, who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mimukin replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility, who have heard about the queen's conduct, will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands, from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Mimukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his household using his native tongue. Remember that we're looking at the book of Esther through the lens of carving a legacy from chaos. And Xerxes is the very one who creates the chaos out of which Vashti is left to carve her legacy, right? Last week we uh, looked at, or yeah, the first week we uh, looked at finding God on the pages of your life. Last week we uh, looked at Xerxes and this whole idea that it's only as we find ourselves, um, as we locate ourselves in this story that God can really do a work in our lives. And so we uh, looked at how we have to admit that we're broken and then God can make us beautiful. And this week we're looking at Vashti. And, and the major lesson which we get from her is do what's right, not what's easy. Do what's right, not what's easy. Now, Vashti was someone who was seen in every press conference, every major function, on the arm of one of the most powerful people in the world. But now she has to make it on her own. She has to pick up the pieces. She's blocked from Xerxes' social circles, and she's replaced by a younger model. Now, minus the whole queen bit, this, this could easily be the story of so many people nowadays. How do you carry on after a messy breakup? How do you keep on going when that scaffolding, those friendships, those relationships that you took for granted are no longer there to support you? Where is God for the Vashtis among us? Xerxes was powerful, the ruler of 127 provinces, and yet history remembers him as this small person who abused his power. He was, he was, he's remembered as being unstable. Herodotus was a Greek historian who lived in ancient Persia, and he records about this time when a storm stopped the building of a bridge. And the result was that Xerxes chopped off the workers' heads. And so when Vashti refused the king, this is the person that she was refusing. Now the king's trying to, uh, trying to convince the princes and the rulers of, his, his, of his, his empire to join him as he attacks Greece. And so he calls in the queen. Now, Karen Job says that this site would have likely inspired patriotism as public appearances of the British Queen do so today. Now, had she said yes to Xerxes' request, Vashti would have been um, lifted into the room 
on a litter carried by seven eunuchs wearing her royal crown. This, this, this moment would have been the apex of Xerxes' seven-day feast and his uh, six-month show and tell. And yet she refuses him. And it seems to me that there is a strength and a courage about this queen as she refuses to play the game of a powerful and unstable man. She, she is at the mercy of forces outside of her control, and, that she, and yet she has a dignity about her even as she vanishes from the pages of the book of Esther. Now, we're not told why Vashti refused, only that she did so. We aren't told why Xerxes got so angry at her refuse, re, refusal, only that he did so. And even though this is frustrating that we aren't told the motives, why don't you just tell us, writer of Esther? It causes us to stop short of turning Esther into a Sunday school lesson and instead invites us to read even more deeply into the text and to see ourselves there. Like I said last week, that life is not about finding yourself. Instead, it's about locating yourself and allowing God to find you in that place. And, and what, what Vashti does uh, is that she invites us to locate ourselves in her story and to ask ourselves as we look in the mirror, can I see Vashti in me? Now I wonder what Jesus would have made of Vashti, this strong woman of character who lived by her principles. Now, now we know that they never met, uh, but, uh, but I can't help but think about those Vashti-like women who surrounded Jesus in his ministry. Women who, who chose to do the right thing rather than the easy thing. Like Mary, his mum, who went ahead with the plan of carrying God's child, even though no one would really understand, and it would risk making her a complete social outcast. Right thing, not easy. What about Salome and the two Marys who in Mark chapter 15 verse 40 stood with Jesus to the very end as he died on the cross long after most of the other disciples had fled? The right thing, not easy. What about Joanna and Susanna who we're told in Luke chapter 8 verse 3 were supporting Jesus financially out of their own pocket? The right thing, most likely not easy. So what would Jesus have made of Vashti? Now, of course, the writer of Esther never tells us the state of her heart. And yet here we see some echoes of Mother Mary, of Mary Magdalene, of Salome, of, of Joanna and Susanna, who all chose to do the right thing rather than the easy thing. And these women are forever memorialized by Scripture because of their principles and because of their, um, their heart commitment to standing firm and also because they knew the right thing to do and they did it. And Vashti is remembered for the same reason. Now, Scripture is clear that standing firm in the power of God is a vital part of the Christian life, a vital part. Jesus' words, you will be hated by everyone because of me. Okay, listen to that. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. He's not saying you make a decision for, for me, when, you, when you're a child and then you're saved, what he says is that you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So, my friends, where, where are you tempted to not stand firm and instead to conform? Where are you tempted to do the easy thing rather than the right thing? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Strengthen them. Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. We live in a world of Xerxes where power is abused and where people are cast aside like yesterday's 
technology, and they're left to somehow carve out a legacy from chaos, just like Vashti. Now, God's plan for for Vashti's marriage was very different as we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the, by, by the washing with water through the words and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Xerxes missed the memo on loving Vashti as Christ loved the church. Rather than treating her as expendable, he should have treasured her. Instead of casting her aside, he should, he should have given himself up for her. But this wasn't Vashti's story. Which makes me ask, where was God in Vashti's story? Now it's tempting to think of Vashti is someone whose story was to simply get out of the way so that Esther could move in. Now, I wonder how Vashti would have responded if someone had come up to her and said, Hey, it's okay, Vashti. God is in control. You see, you are part of a story that is going to be told for literally millennia about how the lives of an entire people group will be saved. Now, if I'm Vashti and I'm hearing that, what I'm thinking is this. Okay, my husband, the king, has just publicly humiliated me. He's now filed for divorce, you know, for the good of the empire. And I know that he's on the hunt for my replacement, who through a series of unique circumstances will end up saving many, many people's lives. And if I was, if I, if I was Vashti, I might ask again, so what's my role in saving these many people? Well, being humiliated publicly, and then you're divorced, and, well, that's it. But you make the way for the one who will save the Jews by being humiliated and then divorced. Well, yes. No, 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 no. But you don't understand. You you don't have to be sad because God is in control. Okay, my point here, folks, is that we need to be very careful when we're throwing around the phrase that God is in control. Because for someone like Vashti, what does this phrase actually communicate? Well, really, that she's an expendable pawn on God's great chessboard who's useful in his great game until she's not and then she's cast aside. Friends, if we mean by God is in control that God absolutely determines everything that has, is, or will happen on planet Earth as some, um, as, as some part of his mysterious scheme for his glory, then we need to stop using the phrase, God is in control. Because that's not what we see in Scripture. And this misrepresents God. You know, right now I could tell you any number of heartbreaking stories from my world travels that strike at the heart of this premise that God absolutely predetermines everything that happens on earth. And many of these stories are not fit for Sunday morning little ears. Friends, I would suggest that the book of Esther paints a different picture of God than a God who absolutely determines absolutely everything that takes place on earth. Now, now I know that, uh, that there are many of my Christian brothers and sisters who, who don't agree with me, and that's okay. They might say, well, God had in mind the saving of the Jews, therefore He deterministically caused this seven-day drunken fest that led to Xerxes' intoxication so that he would summon summon Vashti. And yet in Galatians 5 verse 19, doesn't God's inspired words say, the acts of the flesh are obvious? 
sexual immorality, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some might say that, well, God had... God in his mind had, had the saving of the Jewish people, therefore he caused Vashti to refuse Xerxes' commands to come so that God could sideline Vashti to make way for Esther. God is in control. God is moving the pieces around on the chessboard. And yet, hold on. In Malachi 2.16... Doesn't God say, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord God Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. So how can God hate drunkenness? How can he hate divorce, and yet at the same time have part of his rescue plan, the drunkenness of Xerxes that ultimately led to the humiliation and the divorce of Vashti. Now, I can't imagine God hovering over this Xerxes feast with the alcohol abuse and the sexual whatever's going on and him saying, this is my plan, this is it, you just have to keep going, keep going. If anyone was at work in that feast, I would suggest that it's more likely Satan rather than the Lord God. Holy, holy, holy. So here's the question for those who throw around this phrase that God is in control. Okay, here's the question. In order for God to be fully sovereign, does he need to to deterministically control every aspect of the universe? Or could God's sovereignty actually include the freedom of his creation to act and live freely? Now, I was processing this with someone this this week, and the the argument that's raised by those who hold to a deterministic view of God's rule is this. If God is not absolutely in control of everything, then how can you say he's all-powerful? If you say that God does not predetermine every jot and every tittle of our lives, then you're robbing God of his power and glory and sovereignty. That's how the objection goes. Well, let me respond to that objection with with a wonderful illustration from author Leighton Flowers. This is what he says. Suppose you went for a walk in your local park and you happened upon an elderly man playing a game of chess all by himself. You stop him and you ask him why he's playing both sides of the chessboard and he says, well, it's the only way I know to guarantee my victory. You continue on your way to find another elderly man playing chess with an actual opponent, followed by a line of challengers as far as the eye can see, one by one, they are defeated soundly without much effort due to the wisdom and the abilities of the elderly chess master. Which one are you going to go home and talk about? Which one is really greater and more, more praiseworthy? End quote. Flowers then goes on to, to ask, should sovereignty, quote unquote, be interpreted and understood as the, as the necessity of God to play both sides of the chessboard in order to ensure his victory? Must God be in equal control over the choices of those who oppose him in order to accomplish victory? Or is God so powerful, wise, intelligent, all-knowing, and infinite in his ability to overcome, work through, and in spite of free evil choices to accomplish the ultimate good? End quote. In my first message in this series, I said that God is not mentioned in the book of Esther at all, and that we should view this as an, as an invitation for us to, to look deeper and see where we see God at work beyond the obvious. Esther is messy. There is not much that takes place in the book of Esther that's morally black and white. It's not a sitcom, right? It's, it's, it's real life. 
And we, we see in Esther that God is not the only player at work. In, in fact, the author of Esther is silent on God's actual involvement. But we do see many other players at work. There's uh, Xerxes, who totally lets Vashti down as a husband. We see Esther, who, who seemingly breaks her covenant agreement with with God to sleep with and then marry a Gentile king. We see, we, we see Haman with murder on his mind, and we see Mordecai, whose unwillingness to honor Haman ends up bringing his nation this close to absolute annihilation. And so as I read the book of Esther, it seems to argue against a simplistic reading of God deterministically causing everything, playing both sides of the chessboard, as it were. I see lots of players on the stage. I see many different motives, most of them at best quite shady and at worst outright awful. And yet through it, and yet through it, God takes the worst possible raw material and in his unsurpassed skill and infinite wisdom and incredible creativity he creates something astoundingly beautiful from this wreckage he creates a plan of salvation and this really is the message of the cross isn't it god creating an 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 audacious rescue plan from the wreckage of human sin and human free will what we see on the cross isn't God playing both sides of the chessboard, causing people to do evil for his purposes. What we see in the cross is far more impressive. We see God taking the best efforts of our enemy to ruin us and to frustrate his plans. And then he reverse engineers it into the biggest upset that evil has ever seen. And this for me... This, this uh, view of God is so much more compelling and so much more amazing than the simplistic notion that God is in control. And so for the Vashtis among us who have been cast aside as human collateral by the wicked and broken human beings who were supposed to protect them, for the, for the Vashtis among us who have somehow found the, 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 uh, the, the strength in Christ to lift themselves up whilst being told, it's okay, God has a plan. For those Vashtis, I want to say this. Yes, God does have a plan. He has a plan for justice to one day be served. He has a plan to heal you and to build you up and to make you into part of the downfall of evil, of the recreation of Eden, of the establishment of his kingdom here on earth. He has a plan to gloriously work all things together for good to those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. If you locate yourself in Vashti's story, then Jesus, the good shepherd, says this to you. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John 10.10 10. If you'll let him, God will use those things that Satan would use to destroy you and convince you that your story is done that your yesterday's news, he will use those, those, those very things and he will repurpose them to give you a legacy in Christ. He can do that. Listen to me. God has played the enemy of your soul at chess and he's already beaten him. And he will ultimately win the victory against every injustice, every oppression, every violation, every wrongdoer, every lawbreaker, every Xerxes, every Haman, every challenger who lines up to challenge God will lose. And so I encourage you in this spirit of, of Vashti to establish the principles by which you live and stick to them. Keep on doing the right thing according to God and the Bible, not the easy thing. If you locate yourself 
in Vashti's story, then let me leave you with this encouragement from Hebrews chapter 12. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Instead, consider Christ. And finally, whoever sows to please their flesh from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Galatians 6 verse 8. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap harvest if we do not give up. What a promise. Holy Spirit, help us to see you at work in the story of our lives as you take that horrendous raw material and you carve out a God-glorifying legacy for us. Lord, there is so much brokenness happening in this world. There are so many hurting people who, when they hear this phrase, God is in control, they wonder what sort of God is in control. And yet, Lord God, what we see in Scripture, what we see in Vashti's life, what we see in the Bible is God bringing from the wreckage redemption is God ultimately undoing all that Satan would use to to ruin God's good creation and God's loved people. Lord, there are people for whom uh, simple bumper sticker answers do not suffice. Their wounds are too deep and too too wide, Lord God, to simply put a bumper sticker phrase over and say, there, there, everything's okay. And yet, Lord God, we know that you weep with those who weep and you rejoice with those who rejoice and you mourn with those who mourn and you identify them, Lord, but Lord, because Jesus, you were, you were, the, you were the subject of such great injustice. And so, Lord, help us to consider you so that we will not lose heart. Lord, would you show us how you want to lead us into a, um, into a legacy that fills us with hope and that glorifies you? Show us how to do the right thing and not the easy thing. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, where you are still working in our lives. Which rough edges you're still knocking off. Which areas of shadow you're still shining light into, Lord. And Lord, that we would we'd press in to know you. That we would hunger to know you more. That we would not settle. That we would not coast that we would not, not, not just slide along, but the Lord, that we would take up our cross and that we would follow you and we would know what it is to truly be like you, to give all that we have just to know you because you are forever the hope in our hearts. So friends, here's a blessing for you. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus Amen Know the presence of the Lord as you go into this week. Walk in his might. Walk in his power. Walk in his grace. Keep close to him, knowing that he's holding on to you. Have a great week. Cheers.